And thanks to everyone for joining our panel today on this very important topic. Um, as Gita noted, it is uh, environmental justice and how equity and inclusion intersect with ESG, or environmental, social, and governance. Um, and I'm Gemma Gould, um, Chief Sustainability Officer at IPG, and we have a really uh, great group with us today. Um, so we have Julia Anderson, who is Vice President of Brand Partnerships for Charity Water. So Charity Water is an organization that IPG has worked with for a number of years to help bring clean water uh, and sanitation to those in need around the world. We also have Gilbert Campbell, who is founder and chief executive officer of Volt Energy Utility. He's also an advocate and spokesperson for diversity, equity, and inclusion in clean energy, as well as for environmental justice. And finally, we are also joined by Laura Sutphin, who manages Golan's social impact practice. And Laura and her team have recently spearheaded a study on environmental justice. So I'm going to turn this over to Laura, who's going to share a few slides uh, with us, and then we'll have the opportunity to talk with our panel. So Laura, over to you, and thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, and thanks for this opportunity to talk about the work that we've been doing around environmental justice. Um, I'm going to just start with a little bit of a backdrop. Um, I run uh, the social impact and inclusion practice at Golan, and we're an intersectional team. And we uh, decided this year to take a look at environmental justice, uh, not because it we're starting to see the impacts of it in our everyday, but more importantly, because for all of the scientific studies that are out there in the world about air, the air pollution, you know, outputs of environmental justice, we couldn't find anything that looked at how business plays or should play a meaningful role in charting solutions and what Americans thought about environmental justice. Did they believe it? Did they understand it? What did they expect from businesses and, and corporations um, to play a role in environmental justice? So we talked to 2,000 consumers and we talked to almost 200 C-suite leaders. And here is some of what we found. So um, the, just to give a little bit more um, context around the definition of environmental justice as we had defined it, when we asked uh, consumers what their um, belief was or what they knew or understood about environmental justice, we defined environmental justice as a movement to address the unfair discrimination of low-income and minority communities that are forced to live near environmentally hazardous environments which often you know results in contaminated air contaminated water um, and and other hazards and when it comes to having a real understanding of environmental justice uh, what we found as sort of the adage goes the kids are going to be all right the younger generations gen z and millennials were most likely to believe that climate change and racial justice were strongly linked boomers and gen xers were less convinced uh, but overall america Americans tended to select the right things and the right factors that contribute to environmental justice. Um, but when it came to the C-suite leaders, it got a little more complicated. Uh, leaders primarily thought that it was only a region-based thing, like where you live, um, what that was a defining factor uh, of environmental justice. So I'm going to move. Are the slides moving for you all? Because I can't see them. Are they advancing? Yeah. Oh, now they are. Yep. Now they are. Okay, I'm going to go back one. Um, so just some of our data found just over one half of Americans reported familiarity with environmental justice broadly. But when we asked them to define it, only one third could accurately describe it. And then more than 25% said that they couldn't define it. So we found that there was an understanding gap, a, a, a basis of understanding, but a, a larger gap in kind of defining it and understanding the integration of environment and racial justice issues. And, you know, when, like I had said earlier, when we talked to uh, Americans and ask them to sort of dimensionalize what they understood as the key driving factors around environmental race or environmental justice, they tended to choose the right things. Um, for them, it was things like race, like where they lived and also income. 
But as I mentioned with the C-suite leaders, it got a little tricky because for them, the dominating factor um, that they believed was really, it was only a, a issue of geography, where you lived. And we dug in with C-suite leaders a little bit more, um, and, you know, because we found that to be a little surprising. What we found was that, you know, when we probed, nearly nine in 10 executives agreed that environmental justice was important for corporations to address, but almost half of those that we talked to didn't think that it would lead to tangible outcomes. Um, this, the, the reason for that, and one of the things that we found to be really interesting is because almost 50% of those C-suite leaders felt their belief was that environmental justice was defined as one of two things, either justice for the plants and the trees, or a movement to sue corporations that had harmed the environment. So they were looking at it as a risk factor, kind of something to mitigate um, versus an opportunity for their businesses to take a leadership position. And then we talked to Americans again and asked them what they thought that you know environmental justice um how important was it from a priority perspective and then what did they feel like the role of corporations were in solving this issue and were they satisfied with what they were seeing from corporates what we found was that more than 85 percent of americans believed that environmental injustice was important but only a third of them were satisfied with the actions taken by companies to address that issue um you know we've seen um many surveys over the years of Americans wanting to do more to address key social issues. And environmental justice is no different. Most of those Americans believed that it's important, but very few thought that companies were living up to that expectation. And specifically, they didn't want to hear things that they said that companies were going to do. They, the data showed that they wanted companies to actually get into those communities and do the work to create real change, not just make long range commitments, but close that say do gap with more of the do and less of the say. So I'm gonna stop there and turn it back over to Gemma just um, to take us uh, through the next part of our discussion. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, that was really, really interesting. And, um, you know, I, I, I have a lot of questions um, and a lot of thoughts and I, I'm sure our <laughs> panelists do um, as well based on um, the information that, that you shared. Um, so thank you again. Um, and, and so, you know, Laura, you, you defined environmental justice in your presentation um, and you noted that some of the folks that you spoke with had some trouble sort of figuring out what the definition um, is. And, and so specifically, you yeah. said it's a type of, di of discrimination, right, where people of low income or minority communities are forced to live close to environmentally hazardous situations. Um, so I just want to, I want to ask Gilbert, anything, um, Gilbert, that you would add to that definition? Um, yeah, well, I thought it was, first off, it was an excellent definition. Um, obviously, you know, not having just the, the burdens of, you know, having access, not having access to clean air and clean water and, and food security. But I would also add, uh, as part of like how we kind of, our company, how I define environmental justice as well is also economic justice. So as we're moving towards a clean energy transition, the communities that have suffered the most should be benefiting from, you know, high paying jobs in renewable energy and clean tech and sustainability, but also should be thriving mm -hmm. with starting and scaling businesses. Um, and that's not happening at the rate that it should. So that would be the only thing that I would add to it. Okay, that's, and that's helpful. So it's sort of like, it's, it's not only like avoiding the bad stuff, but it's getting access to the good stuff as well. Um, maybe, you know, to, to simplify it a little bit, but, but I think that's true. Um, and I think that's really interesting. And, and Gilbert, when I, um, when I met you, I think a couple of months ago at this point, um, it was at a climate pledge event, um, and you were mm -hmm. on a panel with Van Jones and he also talked about, he mm -hmm. talked sort of what you were hinting at that it's sort of access to the good things, um, and, you know, mm -hmm. access to local foods and healthy foods um, and, and choices. So I think we don't, we don't want to forget um, that piece of it. And then, um, Laura, I guess just, just maybe quickly to go back to the definition a little bit, why do you think it is so hard to define environmental justice? Like, why, why do people sort of struggle with that term? 
Yeah, it's I think it's for Americans, you know, everyday people, I think that it's tricky because most people are still coming to grips with the these two forces that when brought together define environmental justice, right? People are still gripping, kind of coming to grips with their impacts of climate change in the everyday. And we're starting to see the impacts of that more and more. And it's something that you cannot deny. Um, but we're also, you know, those same people are also trying to reconcile their role in systemic racism and the structures upon which this is built. And the intersectionality of those two things is a lot to sort of understand if you are still grappling with one of those two definitions, much less putting them together and understanding the human impacts. Um, I think for C-suite leaders, it is even more tricky because as we, as our data found, and you can find the full survey, that was just six slides of a, of a snapshot, but you can find the full survey on our website um, on golan.com. But for C-suite leaders, they are looking at this as something to risk manage, not something that could be a seismic opportunity if they brought their DEI commitments and their, their ESG commitments together to work harder. Um, and so I think that that makes it a trickier thing to even have them define if they aren't even looking at it as what the possibilities are, but as something that they have to sort of um, kind of treat with with a long um, a, a long range stem. The other thing that I think is really important to mention is I think that environmental justice as defined is a classic case of otherness, right? Um, if meaning like if it's not happening to me, it's less important or it's less critical to solve. And I think that this applies to all of those audiences, right? But it's very easy to sit in your place of privilege and look at a low income or a community of color and think that it doesn't apply to them because or because they're not in that community, they don't live there. And as the longer that we go on thinking of this from the vantage point of otherness, we kind of delay solving the problem so everybody can thrive. I think so. I, you sort of that's a, a perfect introduction, I think, to Julia um, Anderson from from Charity Water. Um, and Julia, you know, and I and I think when Laura was talking about sort of the intersection of DEI and ESG, um, so many companies are thinking about that. You work, you work with us, but you work with a lot of companies. So I wonder if you can, Julia, just tell us a little bit about the work you're doing at Charity Water. Um, and and I guess what I'm thinking, Laura, is. To me, when I look at your study, it feels like this is an opportunity, right? This is an opportunity for Cute. business to to do more. Um, so, Julia, yes. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what business is already doing, how you're partnering with brands, and what what more can we do? Yeah, that's a great question. I was doing a lot of head nodding, Laura, when you were speaking. So <laughs> I think there's a lot of alignment, and what you were saying resonates with our work as well. You know, we have the immense privilege. Um, my team of working alongside an incredible group of about 150 corporate partners and foundations that are all very passionate about our mission to bring clean water to people around the world. And I think for us, the one thing is that clean water is an inarguable right. You know, I think especially in this polarizing world that we're living in, um, every person can agree that everybody deserves access to clean water. It's a very binary thing. And, you know, beyond that, I think our brand partners really resonate with this fact that clean water can be such a catalyst for so many other things. It's not that we're just giving water to these communities, it's that we are improving health, you know, giving children access to education, empowering females, um, creating economic growth for the areas that we're working in. And so in supporting Charity Water, they're not only helping improve these communities through water, but also supporting the agency and opportunities for these communities to really thrive. Um, and like you were saying, Laura, I think a lot of businesses are feeling the pressure to address the SDGs, address climate change um, with, you know, net zero targets and whatnot. There's actually a lot of companies that are now thinking about what would it mean to be water neutral? So you have brands like mm -hmm. um, BP and Google and Microsoft that are thinking about how can they actually be restoring water back into the communities that they're operating in. So. I think brands are on the hook now because everything is now being rolled up under ESG targets and CSR yeah. strategies. Um, so I think that's a good thing. You know, I think for us, it's also really easy to create that dotted line between climate change and clean water because we are operating in the most vulnerable communities that are most heavily impacted by climate change. And so we know that if communities have access to clean water and we're designing these solutions 
through our local partners with climate resilience in mind. So doing things like utilizing solar power. So we're relying less on fossil fuels, um, you know, improving the material for pipe systems, drilling wells versus digging them by hand, though we are creating opportunities for these communities to just be more resilient and thrive in the long run. So I think for us, it's an ongoing conversation with our local partners. It's a more consistent dialogue with our corporate partners as well as how they can be a part of this effort. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you so much, Julia. And then I guess, Gilbert, I, I want to go back to you and just um, help the folks in the audience understand a little bit more about the work that you're doing at Volt and how, how you're addressing issues around environmental justice through your work. Sure. Um, it starts out, I guess, a little bit of history. I started, uh, co-founded a company called Volt Energy in 2009 that was focusing on doing developing rooftop solar and solar carports for businesses uh, across the country with an emphasis on underserved communities. So we've developed a lot of projects at like historically black colleges, universities like Howard University, where we put solar all throughout the campus, uh, Florida Avenue Baptist Church, which was the first African-American church ever to have solar energy, um, the KIPP charter schools and a host of other institutions where we wanted to just show up so people can see the art of what's possible. And then two years ago, um, around the tragic killing of George Floyd, a lot of companies made very public proclamations to work to diversify uh, companies they're working with within their supply chain. And so with that, uh, one of the areas that was identified was um, utility scale solar procurement. So that's usually done through a virtual power purchase agreement. And that's just companies getting to decarbonization by buying solar at large scale. And so we, uh, I founded a new company, which is Volt Energy Utility, um, about a year and a half ago to develop utility scale solar for large corporate clients. But the innovation that you know wanted to bring to the market was how can we impact communities? So what we did was created this concept called the environmental justice power purchase agreement, which matches how companies are used to purchasing clean energy. Um, but the EJ aspect of it is we launched a foundation called sharing the power foundation. And so with our corporate partners, we collectively, um, contribute into the foundation and making, um, which is making investments in environmental justice, um, but also, as I mentioned early, economic justice by investing in young people from HBCUs to really help build that pipeline of our next generation of clean energy leaders. So, just the way they combine um, going beyond the megawatt, just, you know, with our clients, we just don't talk about procuring electrons. It's how do we do it in a way that's benefiting communities across the country? That's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and then, so Laura, I wanted to, to go back to you because, um, well, first I was curious, you know, you work with clients um, in the business community. To, how did they react to the study is my first, first part of my question. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there was a lot of eyebrow raising um, <laughs> just in sharing the study of like, huh, like almost like a stop the breath, stop the room type of thing, um, which was interesting for us because we know that a lot of our clients, I mean, all, almost all of our clients are working and to try to address ESG issues to some degree, right? Um, and they also are have you know long range DEI commitments. Mm -hmm. um, but most of them, the feedback that we've gotten is, I never, I haven't thought about bringing those two things together in quite mm -hmm. this way. Um, I spoke a few weeks ago at Sustainable Brands and uh, on and featured the survey and I heard that again. Like I can't, you know, some of the comments and from from large brands and some some from our clients are like, I can't even get the right people in the room to have the discussion. Um, and I know that this could be so, so powerful uh, and such an opportunity to advance progress quickly, right? But I, how do I even get the right people in the room to have the conversation? And then how do I help that navigate that conversation um, to to a positive mean, you know, end result? Um, so that's you know some of the the feedback we've got. We got a lot of questions about C-suite leaders, and then we also got a lot of questions from. Uh, sort of corporate reputation leaders inside of corporate mm -hmm. communications departments asking us about the reputational impacts of acting or not acting when it comes to environmental justice issues. So it was a really interesting, it, it's opened up some really interesting different discussions. And that was the goal, right, is to showcase the possibility yeah. to highlight the blind spots and to kind of see what could be done. 
That's amazing. And then I guess I was going to ask you sort of related to that, how are you seeing clients' interests um, change around sustainability in general and then specifically around the environmental justice piece? Yeah, we're at a really interesting time when it comes to ESG uh, within the corporate setting, right? Uh, here in the States, we've got the SEC that's just about to, you know, apply some regulatory um, uh, persuasion to corporations. And so it's now going to be a requirement. Um, the younger generations inside of the workforce are pressuring their, their managers, their leaders, and the C-suites of the companies that they work for to get more in the game. Um, and less performative. I think that culture is also uh, an external pressure, especially with the amount of uh, greenwashing claims that are, you know, kind of taking hold. So I think it's a really interesting time. You know, there's also increased shareholder pressure to do the right thing and not just delay your, your goals from 2030 to 2050, but to actually make tangible progress. So I think that, you know, it's, it, it's a value issue. It's a, it's a reputation issue it's an employee engagement um, issue and and it's an issue um, as I as I keep pounding the drum like the world cannot wait for us to get in the game mm -hmm. and corporations stand to make the most change the fastest so we see our role as helping kind of create that and help them be those change makers and help kind of remove the obstacles wed things together like environmental justice um, help facilitate those conversations inside of, you know, many organizations, which can be so siloed, uh, and then help them chart solutions. That's, that's great. And I, and I think you hit upon something also that's really interesting. And that's that there is hopefully a sense of urgency, right? Because it's sort of, we can't just keep, yeah. keep pushing it, you know, further and further down. And so I want to ask, um, Julia, to, to you, do you see a greater sense of urgency, you know, in the last, I would say, couple of years? Have donations to Charity Water increased in general? Um, and are you seeing the brands that you work with, you know, just to sort of a greater a desire to move more quickly and more urgently around these issues? Yeah, I mean, it's been kind of a tumultuous few years with COVID. So I think that's sort of the outlier mm -hmm. factor that we navigated and had to figure out how do we pivot and make changes. But aside from that, I think, you know, ESG is being brought into the conversation more and more and more. And I think also um, brands, like Laura was saying, are seeing the opportunity with really emphasizing the S element of ESG. So realizing that mm -hmm. the younger generation really cares about brand alignment with social good issues, alignment with be it a, a charity or a nonprofit, that these corporations are really committed to making a difference. So I would say that that has been a much bigger part of the dialogue. I also think, like I mentioned earlier, there is this heightened sense of accountability and rightfully so for brands both internally and externally to evaluate what their environmental footprint is, you know, what commitment they're making to ensure that the world is a better place. And so um, with the external pressure and the internal pressure, I think that we are slowly moving the needle. Um, so that's, you know, fortunate for us. Um, but I think, you know, as far as we're concerned, there are 771 million people that still don't have access to clean water. We've brought clean water to over 15.5 million people. So that is a very small fraction of the problem. And we're hoping that we can partner with brands that are committed to seeing a world where at the end of the day, nobody has to drink dirty water. So it starts with that sort of initial commitment to partner. And we hope that there are brands sort of on the journey with us who, who want to be there at the finish line as well. Okay, that's amazing. I think we have just about a minute left. So Gilbert, um, I'm going to, I'm going to give you our last uh, question. And that's just, if there are folks in the audience, folks who are watching today, um, and they want to support an environmental justice organization, either as an individual or as a company, what sort of things should they be looking for to do that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, first thing I would say is, engage with the communities that you reside in and really understanding like, you know, as a business, um, we buy power that impacts local residents. You know, mm -hmm. we have goods and services that are transported where transportation as an example is the highest source of carbon emissions. So if you're looking to engage, um, there's a bunch of different organizations that you can 
look at, but I would also recommend um, DOE, um, EPA have a lot of resources out there. Um, you can reach directly out to our foundation. It's sharingthepower.org. Uh, uh, but the most thing is just getting engaged. And when I say getting engaged, it's really listening to the community to understand what the needs are and having open and transparent conversations as far as businesses, how can we be better corporate stewards? Okay, that's amazing. And I think we are exactly at time. So thank you all so much. Um, it was great to talk with everybody. Um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation.